Okay, very good morning to you. It is Wednesday the 3rd of June. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, just a reminder before I begin, don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Lots more content coming seven days a week from me and the rest of the team. Uh, but just having a look then across the charts, and as you can see this morning, uh, another case of relative risk on. Uh, equity index futures higher. We had a firmer close on Wall Street. The uh, Dow futures already up another 150 this morning. Uh, the DAX trading up 175, but it's R1 in the futures. Uh, consequently, gold down about $7. T-notes down five ticks. Oil up a dollar. So who, despite what you're reading in mainstream media, which is kind of these ongoing size of protests in America, uh, and also reflected across some other parts of the Western world, as well as the ongoing risk of coronavirus in a second wave. At the moment, market appetite remains fairly um, optimistic in terms of a risk perspective and equities continue to move higher. So, yeah, that's the, the main kind of theme of this morning. Um, and I guess one of the questions that I've had, I woke up, I had a few people just asking me on, on Twitter. So my handle's there. I mean, feel free to, to follow and, and obviously ask me questions if you ever have any. Um, but questions about you know, why are we continuing to rally? Uh, I think it does feel a little bit unusual because it almost seems counterintuitive to the move that we continue to see. And uh, I guess one of the things here, let's just make the S&P chart a little bit bigger to really put this into a bit of perspective. Uh, I was looking on a, a daily chart here, uh, and obviously this was the, the big sell-off that we had when we peaked around all-time highs in February, and then we got to the uh, the route on the March 23rd low, which was this huge sell-off on the pricing in of the, the implications that the pandemic was going to have, not just on the US, but the global economy. Um, but since that point, obviously we've had just this amazing rally um, and if I actually look from a percentage point of view now from where we were at the bottom to where we are now we're up about 42 and a half percent technically now I mean we're trading the futures in the S&P I'm looking at here at 3090 uh, obviously if this trend continues I don't really see much in the way of obstacles until we get up to around 31 13 14 which would be around those highs that we had on the 5th of March and also some area of relevant support and resistance around the Q4 of last year. Anything above there, well then that starts to bring in, you can see that wick high that you had on the 26th and that also the low on the 8th of Jan um, as well of this year, which would be at 3180, so on the road to 3200 once again. Uh, above there, another interesting level would be uh, those lows that we had, the bounce late Jan and also a support area from early January as well of this year. So this all contingent, of course, that all things remain as they are at the moment. But I guess the question is, is, you know, why are we seeing this this kind of ongoing trend here, despite these obvious risks on the table that people keep talking about? And particularly now with things like the riots, obviously, I myself have talked about the potential uh, in the future for risk of further transmission of the virus, given the lack of social distancing, obviously, when when uh, you're having a protest. Uh, as well as other factors that might be risks such as the trade war escalation that we've had. So kind of, I guess, listing out these reasons, uh, there are a few. Uh, and if you, I mean, I, I talk about the, the risk of secondary waves. Uh, don't forget that has not materialized as yet. Um, I, I've seen a few people using, say, Iran as a bit of a reference point. I believe they had 3,000 cases. Uh, reported yesterday, which is kind of right back up there at the peak. And their, their kind of um, bar chart, if you're looking at cases, has kind of gone phase one and phase two is almost mimicking uh, the same as phase one. Uh, I guess that would be a bit of a litmus test of maybe authorities not managing that situation in the best way that they possibly could have done. But in the Western world, at least, it's continued to remain um, cases plateauing in aggregate and compressed in some of the hardest hit areas. So talking about the US and generally the UK and mainland Europe, uh, Italy, Spain and so on. Uh, the other thing is manufacturing gauges have, have showed uh, a degree of economies somewhat stabilizing. We saw that in the Chinese data uh, yesterday. We did have some Chinese data overnight. This was the Caixin service PMI and it was up sharply in May. And of course, 
This comes after the reopening of their economy. Um, it was the largest expansion in nearly a decade for this data set. The rebound was the steepest since October of 2010. So all of these things here are, are helping the narrative, but probably underlying the main crux of the matter of what's supporting markets, of course, is uh, the dual fold mechanism of fiscal and monetary support. So from the government side, they've obviously fired a lot trillions in fact into the um, global economy in order to counteract uh, this downturn from the coronavirus uh, and that's not stopping anytime soon obviously the US going through various talks about potentially more uh, kind of fiscal stimulus and the same happening a second package was being discussed in Germany from Angela Merkel yesterday uh, but then also you've got things like the ECB tomorrow where much like with other central banks uh, the ECB is going to go that extra step further. Um, the likelihood is they're going to top up their quantitative easing program by a, a further 500 billion. And so these are powerful forces underlying this general confidence in markets, looking beyond the risks that are clear and apparent now and thinking about the um, pricing in of the economic recovery that might come in future. Obviously, when pricing the future, that outlook, though, is subject to change. So don't get me wrong, things can change. Um, but again, these underlying reasons of why stocks are continuing to rally. Um, also yesterday, uh, as a kind of footnote, we had uh, oil prices. Again, you can see down here at the bottom, oil continues to rally. Um, you know, it's so interesting looking at oil prices now. There was a chart here. I don't know if you remember, about two weeks ago, uh, I shared this chart and I had marked up. And the reason why I'd shared it is I was looking at this trend line of which at the time we had broken and it was the day after when we had printed on the candlestick. Managed to, After we broke it, we retested that trend line but closed above it, importantly, I thought. And I'd drawn this arrow of what I thought the future price activity might be. And um, yeah, it couldn't have gone more to what I was thinking in that respect and really it's hard to see now much getting in the way of us getting to the psychological um, kind of $40 handle which isn't too far above and that would also bring into play then a full reversal of where we were at around $41 looking on a daily continuation here from when we had that initial kind of fallout where OPEC plus had that meeting you remember at the beginning of March they failed to make an agreement that was when the Saudis retaliated talked about flooding the market under pricing uh, competitors for new customers and that was when we then eventually had that big um, kind of uh, push down into negative prices on that whole Cushing storage issue uh, in the futures market uh, but since then, we continue to recover. I'll talk about oil a little bit more because I do feel like oil is, uh, I think technically, yes, there's some further room, another 3 or $4 on the upside, I don't think would be unrealistic, particularly if the general risk appetite remains as it has been. Um, but there are certainly some expectations now for oil prices built around this upcoming uh, OPEC meeting that we need to be aware of, uh, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, so yeah, oil prices obviously moving higher, that kind of assists the general uh, kind of uh, risk appetite. Obviously that, that very fleeting moment of people panicking about the negative price of oil, which um, realistically, yes, in some ways it, it, it was a reflection of severe uh, kind of misplacement of fundamentals in respect of um, the the destruction of demand through the coronavirus and the, the massive economic impact the virus has had. Also, uh, just generally the oversupplied nature of the market with all of these competing producers who um, all have their own agendas, Russia, Saudi, America. Uh, so that that created and, and it was um, a true move lower. But then, you know, the mechanics of the futures market and the storage issue uh, is what created that that one week of volatility in oil, but you know that ship sailed and left town a long time ago. So you know, that that again's off the off the table uh, for the moment. And then from Brexit point of view, you know cable does continue to remain pretty solid at the moment. You know we're up there at one close to one twenty six handle. Uh, the Dixie a little bit weaker than this morning the currency market. 
Um, so both major pairs on the front foot. Um, but obviously we heard yesterday that a potential compromise on Brexit. And this is a, a kind of a another macro topic that's a little bit being on the sidelines um, in the shadow of the coronavirus and obviously the trade war. Uh, but that is important because there's a deadline looming, as we know, at the end of the month. Uh, Johnson, according to reports, will be told where the EU could potentially make concessions when him and the European Commission president meet in the coming weeks. But that's as long as the UK takes a similarly conciliatory approach. But overall, some kind of lukewarm signals that there could be some degree of coming off these kind of firm stances and, and meeting in the middle somewhere. So, yeah, all of these things are a positive short term. And, and what does that mean for the currency market? Well, you know, this is something I wanted to look at. And, you know, traditionally, when people look at markets, they, they tend to think of um, they tend to oversimplify things, I think, a little bit in a sense that they go, right, risk on, you're buying equities and then risk off. Um, you're looking at, you know, potentially strength in the, in the yen, for example. So from a currency perspective, you're thinking about a flight to quality and things like uh, the Swissy, the yen. But actually, the dollar has been quite a good barometer of risk sentiment. And just looking at a chart here dating back year to date of the Dixie, and you can see here quite a distinct and clear pattern. There was this big rally that came in March. And if you overlaid that with the equity market, it would be the complete inverse relationship. So as equities were selling off dramatically, the dollar was strengthening dramatically. And although that might sound a bit strange, you might think, well, the US economy is going to get hammered here. You, know, you have to think about in broader global economic terms. This is the global reserve currency. And so in times of extreme strife like that, people would um, flock to the dollar uh, in terms of it being, the, uh, in some respects, uh, the greatest store of value comparative to the depreciation of other currencies in respect. So the Dixie rallied aggressively here, but one of the things at the moment is that you've been seeing a reflection of when equities have been moving higher, generally the Dixie's been moving lower and vice versa. And this morning, uh, another case in point, Dixie is down about a quarter percent, major pairs are up, T-notes are down, gold is down, equities are higher again. Uh, and so, yeah, I just thought it was quite interesting to see here then about what does this mean for other other currency pairs. And started looking at the euro dollar last night, and I just want to bring the euro dollar chart into my screen. So just bear with me one second here. So this is euro dollar, and I'm going to switch it over to a weekly chart. So obviously, when I put it on a weekly candlestick, the access you're looking at at the bottom goes back to 2016, 17. 18, 19, 20 to where we are at the moment. So this is bringing in a multi-year view. And you know, one of the things here I was looking at last night was a note out of Deutsche Bank. And Deutsche Bank have said the broad nature of dollar weakness highlights the unwinding of the risk premium that substantially benefited the reserve currency. So as we were just describing, uh, they've said the dollar should be about 10% weaker in narrow trade weighted terms to fully take out this risk premium that was priced in. So again, if we go back to what we we're looking at with the Dixie, you could argue that if we go back to where we were, and obviously we're trading around a 97 and a half in the Dixie at the moment, well, we could get back down to sub 95 at this point in time. Obviously, if that's happening, the dollar's weakening. Well, by default, then Euro dollar pair is moving higher at this point. And for Deutsche Bank, they say that so far that move then uh, remember they said the dollar should be about 10% weaker in narrow trade weighted terms to fully take out that risk premium. They say the move at the moment has only been about 3%. So put those together then, there's still some more room to run over the medium term and they're forecasting DB that euro dollar could go to 115. Now 115 I've marked up here, this would be this area. So if I just put a rectangle around what, what DB are looking at is here. This would push us right back up to those March 9th highs uh, at this point. Before we get there though, there are certainly, we're coming up to a fairly interesting point uh, as we trade a 112 handle now. 
So looking on the weekly, 112.44 was that weekly high that we printed on the, the week of the 16th and also resistance on in the end of December of 2019. We're kind of close to it again during the October period. It's been a, uh, numerous occasions it was acting as support as well over the case of um, Q4 and Q1 of 2018-19 respectively. So quite a key level coming up there on that horizontal just to keep an eye on. But then, you know, do we come up? Uh, kind of got this trend line here as well that I'd be keeping an eye on but then you can see the significance of the 115 obviously psychological at the handle but then that was a key top for price activity in March and June of 2019 also even going all the way back to 2016 it was a real firm area of resistance that then saw euro dollar come sharply lower in the in the 12 months thereafter and it's also added support before so yeah just looking on a slightly longer time frame uh, and about these th these kind of views. Obviously, from an ECB point of view, the ECB are going to be adding more stimulus in the form of more quantitative easing. But at the moment, you know, a lot of that is priced in. Don't forget, if the ECB do not deliver on stimulus tomorrow, it would be an absolute shock. And so, at the moment, the euro dollar price that you're seeing in front of you on your screens is the real price. It's moving higher. That's the market's already priced in that additional stimulus. At that point so uh, again the risk appetite it's a bit strange at the moment it's more like um, the increased assistance by the authorities whether the central bank or the government helps assist the economic recovery which helps economic resentment globally which then typically sees an unwind of the risk premium in the dollar and that's lifting those dollar-based currency pairs at the moment um, I know it's quite quite a lot to take in but hopefully that makes a bit more sense the other thing as well I did see last night that I thought was quite interesting was this. Um, this is a, a graphic via the FT and it's looking at Wall Street's performance, so the S&P 500's total returns percentage. Um, and it's looking at the performance downplays civil and political unrest. So one of the things I'm quite interested in was just looking at a bit of kind of almost back testing of any other previous time in his recent history that we've had some kind of civil or political unrest. And what type of impact has that then had as a consequence on the S&P 500 over that given year? And this, of course, comes after we've had thousands of people marching in protests in New York and Los Angeles last night. This comes irrespective of those curfews in place and it doesn't look like anytime soon that that's going to uh, tail off. So... There's five different examples here. Um, some you might be more familiar with than others, but um, Occupy Wall Street was a protest that happened in 2011, much more smaller to, than compared to some of the others I'm about to describe. The other was uh, the Clinton impeachment. And so this was the kind of period there of the, uh, we're looking in the late 90s. Then you've got the LA riots, that would be 1992. Uh, and then the Martin Luther King Kennedy assassinations of 1968. Now, these were all times of extreme um, uh, kind of political unrest, some of them, particularly 68, obviously being more in regards to a race issue, similar to what we have at the moment. But as you can see here, the percentage return on every single one of these occasions has been positive, if not very positive illustrating then how equity prices reflect a focus on underlying economic and corporate earnings narrative at the time rather than societal and political upheaval. Um, so is this going to be any different? Uh, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think um, at the moment at least the massive support and it is massive from the Federal Reserve, fiscal stimulus from Washington, is putting confidence in the the ability for the economic recovery. The only you know the real risks here are, as I said before, I still think it warrants quite a lot of vigilance to look at these um, coronavirus cases as we go through the next week or so. I've said this before. I'll say it again. Uh, and then of course you've got to keep an eye on the trade war. But you know when it comes to the trade war, uh, yes, it has escalated. But I guess it's one of those where. Uh, we kind of end up in that same situation again. It's almost uh, self-harming in a way, particularly in a political uh, campaigning year when the economy is already depressed on the back of a pandemic for Trump to really push it too far. So yes, he has to have an anti-China rhetoric in order to 
cultivate his base into an election, but he knows full well that he's got to manage it in a certain type of way. And as we've seen many times before, that infinity loop of kind of the trade war cycle, um, you know, are we just going out of a negative and we go back into a positive phase? Uh, will yet to be seen. So yeah, a couple of interesting things there I thought I'd cover. Final things then are in oil. Um, oil, as I said, has been moving higher, but I'm getting a little bit of deja vu, to be honest, because it doesn't matter how many times um, OPEC say something and don't deliver, and then they say this and they change it to that, um, people still generally buy into what they say. And, um, you know, this isn't just oil moving on the back of expectations that OPEC plus are going to roll over their existing supply cut. Uh, there's obviously, as I've said, you know, a bit of a bounce back in some of these indicators, particularly in China, that their economy is stabilizing. You know, on the manufacturing, the service numbers were pretty strong overnight. You know, these other factors are helping. Um, but whether or not we have the meeting this week brought forward or next week, uh, the consensus at the moment is emerging around proposal to cut or to extend the cuts for one month. Saudis are still pushing for three but the talk of the town is at the moment if they can get Russia still on board, which of course is imperative for the cuts to have any type of impact, then it's more likely to be at the lower end one month. Uh, but yeah, just given the the kind of the, the move that we've had consistently higher in oil, uh, I do think that perhaps it could be one of those where a extension of one month becomes somewhat of a disappointment, just given the fact that it's kind of uh, buy the rumor, sell the fact type price activity, because as per usual, I'm sure there's gonna be some real um, speed bumps along the way that isn't gonna make this smooth sailing in order to get a Saudi-Russia compromise at this point, it's something to just be aware of. Um, API oil inventories came out last night, Obviously, this comes as the front run for the, the DOEs this afternoon. Uh, the crude headline figure was a surprise drawdown. So again, another factor just helping support prices in the short term, at least intraday. Uh, crude a drawdown of just shy of half a million. Expectations were for a build of 3.5 million. Cushing a draw 2.2 million. Gasoline build 1.7 million. Distiller 5.9 million. Looking at the calendar for today, uh, what have we got? Well, all of these service PMI numbers uh, these will be the Eurozone final readings, so probably not too much in terms of market moving potential. We do have some German unemployment rate and change coming up in just over an hour's time or so. Perhaps worth keeping an eye on the unemployment rate in Germany expected to tick up to 6.2 for 5.8%. Got a range of 5.9 to 6.8. Uh, the UK service PMI uh, final reading, that's coming out as well a bit later um, this morning and that'll be at 9 30 and then you've got the eurozone unemployment rate at 10 o'clock um, the focus then in the u.s session turns towards the build-up for non-farm payrolls of course that's coming on uh, the jobs report on friday so today we get adp uh, adp is expected to show another quite stark negative reading uh, the expectation is for minus 9 million the range of minus 12 million at the low to a high most optimistic reading of just minus 200,000. But remember, minus 9 million in private payrolls is a pretty huge number, uh, but is actually an improvement because the prior month, of course, we had a loss of 20.236 million of jobs. Um, so something similar that we're anticipating there for payrolls. Um, so an accumulation unemployment rate obviously is gonna go up on a median basis up to expectations are just shy of 20%. Uh, but a bulk of that had already come uh, in the April reading. Remember in May, part of the US economy had already started reopening. Hence the number's not gonna be as just uh, or not as dramatic in that sense. Um, otherwise then, other than ADP, you get the uh, US factory orders coming out at three o'clock. You get ISM non manufacturing PMI as well. You've also got the Bank of Canada interest rate decision. Uh, rates expected to be left on hold at 0.25 percent then you've got the all inventory numbers uh, in the afternoon so that's it i'm not going to go any further than that going to let you guys get on with your day any questions please feel free to to leave a comment on the video and remember to subscribe to the channel and i'll see you guys tomorrow all right thanks very much